This week on CrossFeed. Online churches. Hospital decides child's fate. Speaking in tongues. From Rock. The real Hogwarts. And evangelists descend on New England. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, out here in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts, at St. Luke's Lutheran Church, and it is good to be together with everyone tonight. Uh, sorry, we skipped a week there. Dale got busy, and then things happened Sunday, and we kind of missed each other. So, But we're here tonight. Uh, there's a glitch in email. Dale sent me the stories and stuff, and I didn't get them, I didn't get them until Monday morning. So I don't know. They were, you know, wandering yeah, out weird. there. Because I saw them on Austin. Thursday. Lost in cyberspace somewhere, you know, out there. You know, Cyber Will Robinson and the Cyber Robot, you know, <laughs> danger, danger, you know, so... <laughs> Hey, I had the reason though that we didn't go on Thursday. We went to a dinner theater. Uh, some friends from the congregation took us out, and um, that was really cool. I um, really, I'm, I'm thankful we had some other friends um, watched our kids for us and you know got them to bed and stuff. But um, so we were able to go to this thing, and it was um, it was Peter and Andrew. Uh, it was called Fish Eyes, and it was just a two person. Um, uh, team and they sort of hit these different uh, stories from the ministry of Jesus, sort of through Peter's and Andrew's eyes. It was really cool. It was really um, just very well done, funny. Um, they uh, they rearranged some stuff, like they had um, the the first big catch of fish before um, uh, the wedding of Cana. Yeah, so they had took a few liberties, but it was it was just kind of part of the to to play out the story the way they were doing it. So, you know, it wasn't a big deal, but the, I mean, it really um, gave a good sense of of how to uh, of of who Jesus is and and how just amazing it must have been uh, to be with him, and and being in dinner theater, they actually before anybody ate, they had a prayer. And that kind of, like, huh, okay. But the part that I, that most amazed me is this is like right. It's it's called the Amish Door Dinner Theater, and in fact, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But they're on Twitter, and it's right in the middle of Amish country. And so I thought, Amish Twitter, that's something you never thought you'd hear those two words used together in in the same sentence. Yeah, it could be Mennonites. Um, but here's the question. They're on Twitter. Um, gosh, uh, are they online? You know, what else do they do online? Amish online. <laughs> uh, two words you will. Okay. Well, anyway, um, there are a lot of churches online. Uh, yep. And uh, it's, um, um, you know, one thing, you know, we've always talked about churches, so it's kind of an all-encompassing affair. I mean, you, you talk about, you know, you just don't worship on Sunday, you worship all week. Well, now through uh, online stuff, through Facebook and Twitter and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, email and, and, you know, all kinds of other experiences, a lot of churches are building churches online. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or or supplement. I mean, I think the, this article is from the AP. Um it, it kind of gives the idea that where like the whole church is online, but that, that's not quite. If you, I mean, if you read a little more closely, what they're talking about is all right. Somebody that that can't be there um, on Sunday morning or, or whenever they have services. All right, you can watch the service streaming, and we've actually talked about doing that here. Uh, we just don't have the equipment quite yet. Um, but not only. Is it streaming video, and so the person can actually watch it live? But they have somebody has questions. They've got people standing by with a chat window, so that 
pastor says something in the sermon, something happens in the service, somebody says, what's that? What does this mean? Or, you know, or something like that, that there's people, even pastors, um, where you have like a second or, or maybe even second and third pastor, um, or some other ministry leaders who are there actually answering questions via text chat, um, so I, you know, I think that's which is a cool idea. Okay, now some of this gets silly. Okay, uh, for example, uh, uh, you could have uh, internet communion. You have your own bread and wine or water from home. I thought. <laughs> okay, different kind of communion I'm used to. Have. More or do it that way. One site you, you you can click on a tab during worship to accept Christ as your savior. Yeah, I like that one. Click on the tab. Do you accept? Yes, no. Click on the tab. I like those. <laughs> that's, that's sort of like in uh, you know in like middle school, um, where you've got the the um, girl hands the boy a little thing. Are we boyfriend girlfriend? Check yes or no, or you know something like that. There's a country song about that not too long ago. Yeah, uh, yeah. One of them said this one church, you know, has conducted baptisms through the internet. Okay, I'm not sure how you pull that off. Uh, of course, then, then there was uh, Garrison Keeler many years ago on the Prairie Home Companion. He had a sketch called Lutherans Online. You know, are you? You know, they click through and different things that they want to listen to in the service. So, um, uh, I guess if they can do it at Lake Wobegon, they can do it anywhere. <laughs> See, I've, I've got a problem with the sort of baptizing online thing. Um, I really firmly believe that you can't baptize yourself. And they say in the article, many will only conduct baptisms in person. I, I really, you know, and here's the thing. This is the struggle because like we, okay, we have um, on our church website, we have um, right now we're, we're doing a study on Jude and right now it's, it's just for members uh, because we're just kind of trying it out and getting the people here comfortable. But then once we're done with that, uh, we're going to do a study on Genesis and we're going to invite everybody I mean, the world to, to come and join us for this study. And, and it's just once a week, um, there's a, a few verses uh, posted with some, um, maybe some comments about them and some questions. And then people can answer those questions and, and respond or ask other questions and stuff and carry on a conversation about, um, about that passage. And, um, and we wanted to open it up uh, once our people are comfortable with it so that, um, so that we can reach out you know, to the rest of the world and, and, and realize that the church isn't just about our piece of property or the people that meet here, but, uh, it's a chance, um, you know, and I've even talked to some of my atheist friends about, um, maybe joining in, um, with the, the study and offering their comments and that. And, um, I'm also starting up this Sunday. Uh, I, am. we're starting a new Sunday evening Bible study that is actually something I've already been doing on Sunday morning. Um, it's on, but it's on responding to, uh, arguments from an atheist about the uh, Bible being the word of God. And, um, what we're going to do is we're going to audio record the discussion, post it up on our website, and then other people can listen to it and they can comment and respond and, and we can carry on the discussion beyond that one hour of meeting together, um, throughout the week or, you know, theoretically somebody could come to a particular, uh, section of it years from now. And, and still continue the discussion. And so it's just being able to take that, the work that goes on here on the property and, and expanding it out into the world. I think that's a cool idea. My question is, though, will you extend it into New England? <laughs> Moving right along. Yeah, I don't know. Right are, there, are there other Christians in New England? Well, I'm really lucky because, you know, I'm really close to the place where me and the other guy live, you know, the only two in New England. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh. So th this interested me as a story I put up is that a lot of churches are um, beginning to target New England. Um, as uh, we we talked about once that New England is one of the core, most spiritually dead areas in the country. Um, and which is interesting, of course, because this is the, the home of the, the former Great Awakening. Uh, but now it, but of course, it was also the birthplace of Unitarians. So, uh, you know, very, very cold spiritually. Um, but yet several, uh, uh, other churches are beginning to try to, to build in. Oh, by the way, part of the reason though, of course, especially, for, especially if you get up to Vermont, New Hampshire, you get a lot of little towns, uh, for them to support 
you know, you know, begin another church there. They're very insular communities. It's very hard, uh, but they have an old white congregational, now UCC, uh, church, uh, very progressive, very liberal, uh, very secular. And that's just the whole Maya upset. But there are some people who are trying to start new churches. And it talks about one is, um, uh, Redeemer Fellowship Church, uh, which is, uh, you know, in a 19th century congregational church building that's been closed for several years. Actually, we are two laboratory mice who wish to be on your show as part of an intricate plan to take over the world. And one of the guys says, that, you know, you look at this play area, it's an area of great potential, it's an area of great need. Um, and it really is. It's, it's extremely, um, you know, I'm living here, I can tell you, it is. Um, right now, we're busy planting one new church, uh, Lutheran church outside of Boston, and uh, now another church down the Foxborough area where uh, the Patriots play, is that we're looking at planting and possibly planting a church there. I guess we could call it Patriot Lutheran Church. Well, church and state issue there. <laughs> We're talking yeah. the football team, not the, not the, <laughs> no, I know, I know. <laughs> Actually, well, there's, the, the problem you have there then is a little bit of syncretism, you know, <laughs> two different religions clashing. <laughs> um, hey man, so, I bickered in Green guys, Bay. Uh, so, you know, we all know what the G stands for on the helmet. <laughs> right. That's why we had to uh, reschedule our, uh, uh, when the Packers went to the playoffs, because this was the year that they won the Super Bowl, we had to reschedule our second service and move it earlier, because otherwise everybody would show up for the first service, and nobody, and I mean nobody, that's not an exaggeration, would have showed up for the second service. And, and so, they're like, we don't have space for all those people. Yeah, I, I like this one guy, <clears throat> um, pastor of an institute for church planning in Williston, Vermont, and says, uh, New England's liberal mainline denominations, such as the United Church of Christ and the Episcopal Church, are practicing a different religion. I'm not saying to be snooty, but they have a different belief system, and that belief system is not is a profound departure from historic Christianity. Absolutely it is. He yeah. is not joking. Yeah. So, you know, that is something to keep in mind. Um, you know, and you might say especially in New England, but really anywhere. Um, and and I've I've told people this repeatedly. You know, on the one hand, we as churches, um, as Christian churches, need to work together, okay, and um, and see what we can do in the community and and um, to build each other up. And and I encourage you know studying together. I'm hoping to get other Christians from our community to get involved in some of our online Bible studies and stuff like that. Uh, and just just trying to work together on things. At the same time. We need to recognize that um, there are some pretty significant differences, and that it's important that we talk about those differences, and um, and also recognize that just because a person goes to church somewhere, and that's regardless what kind of church it is, you can't just automatically assume that that person um, has saving faith in Christ. Now, on the one hand, you kind of want to give them the benefit of the doubt. You don't want to go up to people. Are you saved? Are you sure? You know, um, and, and kind of get in their face about it. But, you know, at the same time, have those conversations, you know, talk about, and, and a good way to start out is, is talking about, um, things that, that happen in your life and, and what you believe and, and how your beliefs help you deal with those things or, or, or how your beliefs answer the questions that are raised by those situations. You know, and it can be something like, for instance, um, my step grandfather passed away this week. And, um, so I'm going to miss him. All right. It's been a long time since I've seen him and I kind of wish that, um, that I'd gotten a chance to see him. I mean, it's been several years, um, but at the same time, I know I'm going to see him again, you know, and I have that assurance because he was a Christian, you know, he knew his savior and someday we're both going to, going to be alive together. And, you know, and so I can talk about that and, and share that hope. And, um, so I don't know, sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> yeah. Um, but up here, uh, I mean, one of our, um, uh, one of the interesting things about Boston is that 
Boston is the largest concentration of college and university students in the world. Second place is Moscow, and they have less than half as many as we do in wow. our area. So that's that's that really is true. And uh, of course, Harvard. And I was talking to one of the pastors here, and he was telling me about how much persecution our Lutheran students at Harvard receive. Really? You know, for just things staying up for just basic things, uh, uh, supporting uh, 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 the unborn. Um, and, and other things that are just really simple. Uh, the one guy on here, I, I, he really does hit it. He's, uh, he's from uh, up in Watertown. He says, um, um, churches that preach traditional dogma can be branded intolerant. Up here, it's tough. It's tough, he says. It always has been. And um, it was interesting. I was talking to this guy in a coffee shop who's unchurched, and... Um, and things. He goes, yeah, my wife and I are looking for a church, but it needs to be, it really needs to be tolerant. You know, and I, mean, so I, just, I just kind of wonder, okay, I wonder what he's going to make, would make out of me, you know, and stuff. And would I be tolerant enough for him? You know, or does that mean, you know, uh, uh, but I somehow know that I mean, it has to be, you have to be full born, okay with gay marriage or whatever. I'm not sure what he means by the term. But, you know, yeah, if you don't, you know, see things in a liberal, progressive way, you're seen as intolerant. Uh, but there are many people out there who just have nothing mm-hmm. and uh, are, are searching. Uh, and that's uh, a key thing, just uh, help people search. Uh, interesting, this, this one new mission that we've got going, the name of the church is Connecting Point Lutheran Church. And... Um, to, to connecting people to Christ in community. And I just think it's a really cool idea that they're going to highlight, you know, that, that, that people lack connection, people lack community. But in Christ, we have a community. We have the community of believers. We have the church. And so they're, they're developing it that way. That's cool. Yeah. Um, you know, you take, a look at, you take a look at your town and you take a look at the number of churches. You know, I, I looked at, at where I am here in North Ridgeville. And, and that's just our, our town. I mean, we're, it's the suburbs, so there's lots of other towns around us too. Um, but you know, we've got, um, there's about 20 churches here and about, um, something like uh, 24,000 people or something like that. Well, none of us are averaging, you know, a thousand plus people on a Sunday. Um, not even the, I mean, there's a, there's at least one real big church in town, but um, but I don't think any of us are have that kind of an average on a Sunday, and maybe the one. But I mean that just goes to show how few people on um you know and, and not that not that being in church on a Sunday is necessarily an indicator of Christian faith you know, but I think it it also it does indicate. Um, that there's a lot of people out there that, um, you know, for them, for, for lack of a better way of, of saying it, Sunday's just another day for them. And, um, regardless when they connect, um, there's a lot of people that aren't connected that, um, that, and and, cause I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you have to go to church on Sunday because we have a Wednesday night service here and, and stuff like that. And, and some people, um, they just can't make it for whatever reason, but there's a whole lot of people that are unchurched. You know, we've got a, a significant percentage of our, um, our preschool, our unchurched families. And, um, you know, I'm making a point of, of going out and visiting them and, and stuff. And in fact, all of our preschool parents, but I, you know, I, that just struck me that We've got a, a, a pretty good chunk of unchurched families that are sending their kids to our Christian preschool that is, you know, we make no illusions about the fact that we're a Christian preschool, we're a Lutheran preschool, you know, and, and stuff, and, and they're going to learn about Jesus in our school and that. And, and they're sending their kids here uh, for whatever reason. And, um, you know, so... But I was just, I was kind of surprised at how many, because I, I, I kind of thought, you know, there's lots of kind of secular um, kind of daycares, preschool, stuff like that around here where they could send them. Um, but they chose to send them to us for whatever reason. You probably have a good reputation. We do, too. Um, 
Well, well, let's stay in New England. Let's go a little bit on the north shore of uh, Boston to the wonderful town of Salem, yep. uh, <clears throat> which um, now Salem, there is not much in Salem. OK, I've been there. I did a wedding up there once. Uh, there's some beautiful historic buildings. There's actually a very big port. Used to be very, very busy in Salem. It's kind of neat to see. Uh, but of course, what really Salem, Salem's really known for, of course, is the witch trials in you know the 1600s. It's mm-hmm. uh, kind of their claim to fame. Um, although none of them were witches and thing. But now, um, uh, but there is a statue of Samantha Stevens in the town. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> there by TV you know, Land. There, there was actually a, a bewitched episode where they went there. I don't know if it yep. was recorded on location, but oh yeah, um, yeah, that was actually done on location. Yep, it? but uh, but otherwise, I mean, so because of that, though, uh, uh, those those trials, there really is a lot of witchcraft going on in the in, in Salem. Uh, Halloween's always a big festival up there; a thousand, thousands of people go up there every year for that. But uh, you could drive, walk down the road, you walk down the street, you'll see witchcraft shops, tarot cards, uh, pentagrams hanging from every place. And now there is a witch school going into Salem. Do they have like a, um, you know, a big lake with a giant squid in it? No, no, no. But uh, no, that's going to be down at um, Universal, uh, oh. Universal Florida. Yeah, yeah, that's but, right. Yeah. See, I, I so said anyway, that if you're going to do a Harry Potter theme park, you got to have people stand in line. And then all of a sudden the line moves and all of a sudden you're standing in line for a different ride. Cool. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Sorry. this uh, place is called uh, uh, the Witch School. Um, it's going to be next to a small Christian church called The Gathering and Rockefeller's, which is a restaurant, which is where the first church of Salem was founded in 1634. Um that, by the way, is always really key up here. Is when you drive around up here, and all of a sudden, says the name of the town and what year it was incorporated. You know, so it's always like my town's older than your town. It's kind of a big deal up here. Uh, so, um, um, and it says it hopes it receives a a warmer welcome than it uh, received in Illinois. Uh, it was uh, a town in central Illinois near the India border. And Hostile. churches held prayer sessions in an effort to drive the pagans out. Yeah, yeah. There's a group that anointed their tires on their cars with holy water and drove around to protect it from the witches that were coming. Um, yeah, because nothing says Jesus like, by the way, we're praying that you, or nothing says, I mean, Jesus loves you. Like, we're praying that you leave. <laughs> you know, the, I mean, this isn't like really all that big of a deal. There's already all kinds of, of um, sort of witchcraft shops and stuff like that. I remember um, uh, when I was going to school in Madison that uh, down on straight state street, there is a store called Shakti or something like that. And it was like a Hindu kind of store, um, but they had all kinds of stuff like that and incense. And, you know, that was, I, I bought incense there cause I used it as air freshener, but um, they, uh, that stuff is really, you know, if you lived in a city, pretty much anywhere, you're going to find that kind of stuff. But yeah. um, the, it was just, I think the thing that, and oh, this place also has an online presence, which doesn't every store, um, but they actually have online classes. Um, Jim, you teach online classes. Do you do tarot card um <laughs> No, <laughs> but the, the witch school does. Now, I, I don't know. It says he has 200,000 students. I can't really believe that. Uh, Wicca, tarot cards, psalmistry, ancient gods, voodoo, uh, meditation, and other subjects. Even has a course called How to Get Better Press for Pagans. Uh, it has a night, radio show called Pagans Tonight and has a YouTube division called Magic TV. Magic with a K. Um, so yeah, they had revenues of $250,000 last year. This is a for-profit business. This isn't like a church of, you know, Wicca or something, you know, that kind of thing. Not that they would use that term, but, um, 
And, and in fact, I, th- I thought it was interesting that they do Wicca and Voodoo. That I always thought that those were kind of separate and distinct from each other. But I think if it's occult related, they do it. I think that's kind of their idea here. I'd like to look them up on the internet, but the guy says they have a very bad uh, internet site. Matter of fact, he says uh, our internet company is terrible. So I don't know. So they're yeah. working on that. But, but I'm um, glad to know they have kind of like the same problems everybody else does with internet stuff. But uh, um, it just struck me that how okay, um, you know this this raises the question for Christians. Something like this comes into your town, into your neighborhood, you know, whatever. What do you do? Do you pick at them, you know, and say, go away, you know, witches or whatever? Or or, or how do you respond to that? You know, and, and I really think that we as Christians need to say, you know what? We we don't believe what you believe. Um, we, we really think it's wrong. Um, but we'd love to talk to you about it. Mm-hmm. And... um. And, you know, and while we're not going to support what you're doing, um, we're still going to love you. We have found the witch. Why we burn, huh? You know, I, again, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I look at uh, St. Paul and, uh, you know, he went to Ephesus and, he, you know, spent, what, four years in Ephesus doing. And they, they talk about bringing out all of their, uh, their books of witchcraft. Matter of fact, books of witchcraft in, in, the, in New Testament times were often called Ephesian writings. Because that was huge in that area. But think about that. The early church was made up of a lot of witches. And, you know, and, you know, people who, you know, worked with witchcraft. Uh, we don't think of that. Uh, I have a pastor, uh, one of my, um, demon profs, and, um, he's, pa- That's he's, uh, D period M I N. Yeah, right. Talking. Doctor of Ministry Professors. Uh, <laughs> but he's a pastor up in, um, not Salem, but right across a town called Beverly. And he said they get a lot of people in this church from Salem, a lot of people coming out of witchcraft. Um, and a lot of the women, uh, all, you know, were really kind of, you know, drawn to it because a wicked tends to be very uh, feminist-centered. What do you do with wicked? Uh, and, you know, they found the churches, you know, to be other, you know, and, and struggled then. And so... Um, you know, but these people were hurting. A lot of them, going to, a lot of them were abused as kids. Um, not saying all, but some. But they, you know, they were hurting. My my daughter used to have a lot of Wiccan friends, and they were they were searching for something. You know, searching for that empty God space there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just because you know, I think that too often we see this kind of stuff, and and for one, you get you know people hear witchcraft, and and they get all these kind of weird. Um, images in their head and um and you know you get the sort of wizard of oz wicked witch of the west and well we can get rid of them by pouring water on them kind of thing um but at the same time um it's you know for one it's really nothing like that uh it's more like you know sort of new age um religion is probably the closest um what most people are familiar with but it's the other thing is, is these are people, these are people that Jesus died for and the word of God is powerful stuff. And, you know, I think too often we think, well, this person's a, um, this person's never going to want to listen to what we have to say or whatever, but you know what, boy, it's amazing. Sometimes people that you, you think are, you know, would, the, you, you just kind of want to say lost cause. You know, but then again, look at St. Paul. He's a perfect example of someone that, I mean, he was going around killing Christians and that's how he got his reputation. That was what he was famous for. And he was known all over for it. Look at who he is, you know, look at what he became. And so God is, you know, with, with, and, and in fact, that phrase with God, all things are possible. All right. That was used in two places. Number one. Um, Mary conceiving and giving birth to the Messiah, to God in the flesh, right? The other one was related to conversion. You know, Mm -hmm. with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Right. And it is. So, uh, you know, pray for them, love them. If you know anybody involved in in witchcraft or Wicca, um, 
show them the love of Jesus. That's that's right. what it's all about. And not just getting in their face and, and saying, hey, you should believe this, but love them. Be there for them. Don't don't look at them as a as a sort of as a merit badge. Okay, look at them as this is just somebody who who just needs to be loved, and and that I can, um, you know, hopefully gain a friend in the process, and and you know, um, just look at people as people, not as goals. Maybe the human race deserves to be wiped out. Well, can't think of a good transition to either one of our other two stories. All right, I got one. Talk about okay. looking at people as people. Um, we Let's uh, go across the pond over to the U.K. Yeah, okay. I, I was thinking about that. Yeah, speaking of people, people are not simply as dollar signs or whatever it is. <laughs> or, or initials. <laughs> or initials. Baby yeah. RB. Okay, you, you, you're really our 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 our, our uh, uh, pro-life guy. Well, we both are, but I mean, you, you're really kind of you, you get very passionate about it, and so I'll let you introduce this story. Okay, um, we've got this is uh, over in the UK, which has uh, government-run healthcare, um, and I'm talking about the UK. I'm not talking. I'm not trying to like comment on the what's currently going on in the United States or anything. So please don't take it that way. Um, but, uh, he, he, and we, we don't have any names here. Um, the, all the names are being withheld right now. And so you just have the father, you have the baby who's being referred to as baby RB. Um, and this baby was born with congenital myasthenic syndrome, CMS, which is a muscle condition that severely limits movement and the ability to breathe independently. And he's been in the hospital since birth. And, um, Basically, the gist of it is that the hospital says, you know, um, we don't want to keep all the the life support and everything that's that's going on with this baby, and and we really um, believe that we should be able to withdraw uh, this uh, kind of life support and that, and and you know, they're not saying that it's because of money, uh, but um, you know, they're saying that well, this baby's not going to have be able to have the, the kind of normal life and all that kind of stuff, even though um, they, uh, the you know, there's they've got footage of the um, baby, was it reacting? Um, you know, this baby can smile. This baby knows that he or she um, is loved. And oh wait, here, uh, son. All right, it's a boy. Um, and you know, and, and this guy's saying, look, this is my son. It's not up to you to decide whether he should live or die. Right. He's yes. He needs certain, um, you know, medical things to, to keep him alive. And he's always going to need that, but he's fully conscious and, um, and is happy because he doesn't know anything else. I don't think you're happy enough. And um, but they're saying no, and it and the the court seems to be leaning um, toward the hospital, and and saying no, you know, eh, that's no way to live. But who decides that? Humans don't deserve to live. They deserve to choose for themselves. Well, apparently, the mother thinks it's a good idea because she's supportive of the hospital and. Uh... You know, again, you know, I mean, we're just reading a story, so we, we can't even see, you know, uh, maybe the hospital's right here. Um, but my concern is... Um, you know, Magneto's right. There's a war coming. Uh, uh, um, concentrate, Pinky, concentrate. Um, what is being done? Okay, it says, um, yeah, uh, um, you know, the Mar- in March, the uh, uh, um, you know, there's talk about another... Uh, situation where the high court ruled it was the best interest of a child known as baby OT to have him taken off a, a, a ventilator. Well, you know, I mean, if you have a machine that's doing your breathing, you cannot breathe on your own. Um, you know, okay, granted, that might be a short-term thing, but if it's a long-term thing, you know, without being on this, this, this ventilator, without having the machine breathing for you, you will die. Matter of fact, uh, um, baby OT could not breathe on his own, and he died. Um, okay, I, I can understand that, because there you go into an extraordinary measure. 
And short term, you know, I, I had a, a member who, you know, under, went, underwent surgery, had to be on a ventilator for a couple of days, but after that didn't need it. But if it's, if it's the only way you're possibly going to live, okay, that's, that's slightly different. Um, but in this case, I can't see anything that talks of really about any extraordinary means. Um, it says uh, his brain is not affected by the condition. Uh, he can see, hear, and feel, recognize his parents. He's also apparently able to play with toys. Right. So I, I just, um, that's what the lawyers say. Uh, I, but uh, uh, um, you sure you're on the right side? You know, uh, I can't, I can't, uh, uh, um, but it says, on the other hand, it says, uh, you know, the father feels strongly has quality of life that demands that we, the trust should continue to provide uh, life-sustaining treatment. Uh, but it doesn't really explain at any place in here what the life-sustaining treatment is. Right, yeah, we don't have that information. I mean, life-sustaining you know, treatment and, could be that... Um, you know, he's got to stay in an oxygen tent. You know, we don't know. We don't know. Or sometimes it can simply be a tube for food. Yeah. You know, but, I wish we, you know, I, I, I would like to know a little bit more about what kind of the, you know, exactly what the treatment is he's receiving. Then my, I could make a bit more of a, uh, a, again, part of the problem, and I hate to, you know, kind of talk the other side of this, but is that, you know, there's not an unlimited amount of money. And if you spend thousands and thousands and thousands keeping him alive, then you can't spend thousands and thousands and thousands on other children in need. I'm a big fan of money. Sadly, that's the reality. I don't know. I just, there, there's got to, I, mean, I guess I look at it and I say, okay, you know, if that's the case, then where else can we cut, you know? Maybe we can maybe we can cut from some other. I mean, because let's face it, there's so many. You know, I mean, just looking at our own country, we know about all the pork. All right, we know about all the money that the government's spending on all kinds of of things that you know what they really don't need it. And uh, or or there's you know it could be when you're talking about saving human lives versus. Um, just some of the really ridiculous kinds of things that, that get funding. And, well, I mean, you know, stop and think about that. Stop and think about how you're, you know, and this, this goes to our, uh, you know, to those who are in charge of making these sort of government decisions about where the money goes is, well, you know, we look at how much is being spent and stuff, but boy, how much more good could be done, um, by by doing this by um by by giving more money to this and of course you know the other problem is that um and especially in a where you have uh and again please don't take this as a political thing uh, there's pros and cons to both systems um but where you have government run health care you know it's not it's not privately funded and um and you've got you know, somebody needs a, a ride home. They live next door to the hospital, and uh, and they're they're at the bar, and so they call an ambulance. Ambulance comes and gives them a ride home, or gives them a ride to the hospital, and they walk next door. And I know that happens because uh, <laughs> I, I know somebody who's a British uh, ambulance driver. <laughs> As it so happens, not to, not to go down that road, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, somebody get, does get spent silly uh, in, in our country, that's for sure. Um, it was just revealed yesterday that um, uh, $5 million in stimulus funds are going to be spent here in Massachusetts to build a footbridge across Highway 1 from a parking lot over to uh, Gillette Stadium where the Patriots play. I'm like... What doesn't you know? I mean, you know, aren't these people rich enough that they can't do it to pay it for it themselves? Or was it they're going to spend eleven million dollars building a footbridge on the Microsoft campus? I mean, a town, uh, you know, a, a, a you know, a company only has thirty three billion dollars on its balance sheets and cash. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they could afford to build their own darn footbridge. Um, but um, you know, uh, uh, but still, there there is a limit to how much. You know, money there is, and there's a limit to to what we can do. And there's, you know, 
a lot of the story upsets me. Because, I mean, it seems to me if he can recognize his parents, correct to play with toys, doing things, then, you know, he can't be on a ventilator or anything because that would keep you there. Yeah. I mean, uh, no, I've, I've got um, somebody that was actually just on a ventilator a couple weeks ago. Um, she's home yeah. now. It, it was a, a somewhat miraculous um, turnaround for her. Um, but, uh, you know, she was, she'd lay there and, and she was kind of barely conscious, but she could, um, she was actually, she would take someone's hand with her finger and start writing on their hand to try to convey, you know, so she was fully conscious and, uh, you know, she, she wanted me to give her communion, but I mean, obviously I couldn't cause she was on this ventilator. But she was sort of expressing to me how much she wishes that I could, and so since once she was home, then I I made sure I did. But um, it was um, I don't know because I I look at that and I go, you know, just taking the case with her, all right? She was fully conscious, all right. It's not. I mean, she was able to receive love. You know, and I, I don't know, where do you, where do you draw that line? And I don't know, if that person can receive love, can it, can experience it in some way? You know, obviously if the person is, is unconscious, they're never ever going to be conscious again. And, and there's just, you know, stuff keeping them alive, keeping their body moving. But, well, yeah, you know, then at that point, you've you've crossed that line and and you're not really even keeping them alive at that point anymore you're just sort of prolonging death but where you have where the person is is conscious boy that's i i really think that you're you're killing there uh i i think that you're you know you're ending a life you're not just prolonging um you're not just saying, well, this person's basically dead anyway. And I really think that something needs to be done to, to prevent that kind of stuff. I, th- I think that we put so much emphasis, and, and maybe it's just because we're so spoiled in the Western world for the most part, um, that we put so much emphasis on the quality of life. Um, what was it? Norway or Sweden? Uh, just passed a bill that declared high-speed internet a basic human right. And the reason they did it was to get, they said, look, it, nowadays you need it, and um, and we really need to get it out into the rural areas. Okay, fine, all right? But a basic human right, uh, you know, to say it's really important and it's necessary and we need to do something about it is one thing. You know, but to put it up there with, you know, basic human freedoms and, and, and food and clothing and, you know, and, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I, I think we really need to reassess needs versus wants um, or needs versus rights. Uh, well, I heard somebody once say yeah, I said cable TV was a basic need. So I just, you know, I, I know. But is speaking in tongues a basic need? <laughs> Is that what you need to be saved? Yeah. Yes, you need to be saved. Okay, so Pentecostals, and the Church, the Assembly of God is, of course, the largest Pentecostal body in, in the world now. Well, one time it was the United you know, uh, you know, Church of Christ, but it's no longer. Um, and, of course, the, the, the Pentecostals were best known for what's called glossolalia, speaking in tongues. <sighs> or not really. Um, now it's interesting that uh, to a large extent, what was once um, the, 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 the speaking tongues has kind of moved out uh, among younger Pentecostals. The uh, younger Assembly of God is that the Assembly of God really be kind of can be more of a mainstream church instead of a kind of a fringe church. No. Um, I remember back in the through the sixties, seventies, and eighties, the Assembly of God was one of the fastest growing church bodies in in the country. And it's become a little bit more mainstream. Uh, some of that stuff on the on the speaking in tongues and uh, getting slain in the spirit and some of the strange things you might see in those churches has kind of gone out. Now they still, it's a, a one of their um, their kind of core doctrines is that you do need to speak in tongues, um, sort of initially that once, um, 
after you're baptized, that there's the baptism and there's a spirit baptism, and that you're really not a Christian, they say, um, until you have that experience. Which I've, you know, I mean, as Lutherans, we've got some real problems with that, um, saying that, you know, so what, I've never spoken in tongues, therefore I'm not saved. Uh, I'm sorry, I question that. But you are, you're just, you're just not as holy as others. Okay. Uh, but uh, they, it's like I said, but during this, this hour-long uh, worship service and this Assembly of God, nobody spoke in tongues. Um, uh, and if the guy says, well, you know, he says, um, um, you know, uh, he just pastored this church, and he says, you hear me, this uh, speaking tongues, uh, once every two or three months in the church. Uh, but I... I, I, I uh, we do stress that the initial physical evidence of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, but we don't encourage people to seek, to seek tongues. We encourage them to seek God and to seek the power of the Holy Spirit for witnessing. Tongues is just a byproduct of that. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that, that comment, too. That's, that's, that's almost a, yeah, that's a very biblical comment there that, yeah, okay, that's, that's what it's all about. Because um, St. Paul it, said it, that. He said, don't seek Yep. Um, speaking in tongues. And so that's always kind of floored me when they say, well, you should seek speaking in tongues when the Bible, you know, the Bible says not all speak in tongues. Right. Matter of fact, he even talks about what a little bit later. He says, you know, Paul would say, rather you preach, you know, five words, one that can be understood. He says, there's a lot of people out here dying without Jesus. I need to talk to them. Um, so it's just amazing that that, that turnaround. But apparently it's causing some consternation among some of the older Assembly of God guys because this was kind of their, I mean, um, their, their thing. Although I, I met an Assembly of God preacher in Springfield, and he told me that he didn't really emphasize the, the speaking on tongues stuff either. Um, matter of fact, there's a couple of large Assembly of God, Bethany Assembly of God and a couple other, uh, and they... They really looked uh, very uh, waringly at uh, their brother, A.G. Pastor Benny Hinn. Uh, they thought he was a false teacher. Well, you know, I had um, people in my last congregation that um, had been members of an Assembly of God church for a while. And um, and they said, yeah, but, you know, we didn't really have all that kind of stuff. They said that when they joined the church, um, they were talking to the pastor there. And, um, and, and he told them, he said, yeah, we kind of keep out the granola group. You know, the fruits, nuts, and flakes. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the, um, I, I really like what this guy said, um, about, you know, people dying here. And, and he said that, um, you need to, t to talk in, talk to kids in a language they understand. Right. Um, we're not. That may be glossolalia talking to some kids. I can't. <laughs> Especially as you read uh, their, some of their, their, their Twitter feeds and their uh, emails. I'm sitting there trying to, you know. No, that would be cool, texting in tongues. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, he says, yeah, it's more profitable if I, if I speak in your language. Yep. Um, I, 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 reading through some of the comments, I, I really got a kick out of this one. Um, that it reminds me of a story my dad told me. My grandma was always speaking in tongues at church and getting up and throwing her arms in the air and so were a bunch of other people. Uh, they wanted to save my dad for something or another, so they put their hands on him and started babbling. He said he started shaking. He threw his hands in the air and jumped up and down. Last time they went because someone in the church said they saw horns growing out of my dad's head when he was babbling. I asked my grandma before she died how to speak in tongues. She started laughing. said she never knew how. She just mumbled a bunch of gibberish. <laughs> oh, there's, that, that there, kind of... there's a guy at the seminary I can't, um, that he for, he was taking a class and um, one of the assignments was to attend uh, um, you know other churches and that and so he he attended a Assembly of God Church or some other Pentecostal church and and uh, that started doing all the speaking in tongues and there's people up in front that were interpreting it so okay so here he is this Lutheran seminarian. Um, he stands up and starts reciting the Lord's Prayer in Greek. <laughs> and somebody stood up and they started interpreting it. <laughs> it wasn't even close. 
<laughs> closest thing I've ever gotten to speaking in tongues is asking that marvelous question, who put the bop in the bop shabop shabop? <laughs> and who put the ram in the ram on ram and ding dong, you know? Oh, man. We're going to get angry comments now. <laughs> <laughs> No, I d- seriously. Um, when I was in college, um, I, I got into charismaticism, and I really got into this idea of wanting to speak in tongues and, and wanting to to you know to have the, you know all that, and um, you know. But finally, came to the conclusion that a lot of that uh, it it was you know it was me centered. It was emotion centered, um, and that's. And I had another friend of mine who who was charismatic, and he said he got out of it because he he got into cults. And he said, "Well, what's it between really between himself and a Mormon? Because it was all all personal experience." Yeah, you know, it's it was all you know how I feel about it or what I you know and stuff, and it was all based on feelings and emotions, really. Well, remember, Saint Paul says, "Test the spirits," you know, and you really got to look at it, and there's an easy way to do it. Is it pointing you to Christ? Is it pointing you to the cross, to the empty tomb? Is it, you know, whatever it is that you're experiencing that seems to be some sort of spiritual thing, is it reinforcing this concept of God's love for us, that he has forgiven our sins and given us eternal life, right? If it's not pointing you in that direction, if it's pointing you to any sort of fringe, peripheral, anything besides that, Boy, you're missing the point, and if and it ain't God that's directing you that way, you know. So, uh, you know, that was something that when Luther um, first, when he went to the monastery, and he said, um, you know, his his dad was all upset because he wanted him to be a lawyer so he could take care of him in his old age, and uh, and he said, well, God gave me the sign, and his dad said, how do you know the devil didn't? zap you on the butt with lightning you know <laughs> and so you know anytime that um you know that we see something and it's a sign or we experience something and we think it's a sign you, you know you, you gotta stop and ask all right if this is a sign who's it coming from and you know what if it ain't clear or it you know then for one you got a question is it even a sign or is this just you know coincidence or whatever um or, and and if you really are convinced that it's a sign, where's it coming from, and and what's it, what's the message, and if it's, you know, especially if it's focusing big time on your works, um, apart from the message of the cross, boy, stop and ask, who's really talking to you there? I got a bad feeling about this. Yep. So, uh, we did get some email last a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what was what was that message we got that a, we got? We got a comment on YouTube. Yeah. Um, we were talking about the um, the calendar, the, the Mormon muffins uh, yes. calendar. And, uh, and here's the comment, and I'm not even going to pron- try to pronounce the username. Um, he said, I find it sad that you laugh and encourage the sexualization of women. Uh, Chad Hardy, which is the... Um, the guy that does the calendars was excommunicated for sexual promiscuity. He later lied and said it was about the calendars. Chad agreed to rules when entering BYU. And then he got upset when BYU enforced the rules. Now he's striking back and your types are sensationalizing it. You know, I've read a lot of articles about this guy, um, and, and the stuff that he's doing and none of them, um, have ever said anything about, uh, promiscuity right but th- that's that, that's kind of beside the point first of all first of all if he was being promiscuous if BYU had a problem they should have expelled him that's mm-hmm. that's what you do uh, you don't say well he's only got two months left I don't care if he's broken the rules you expel him if you do not expel him you do not withhold his diploma at the end I mean, if that's just it. I mean, you, you, that's playing, you know, you, you can't play that kind of game. Uh, we had a situation when I was in college and I thought the, the president of the, of the, um, student body had abused his office in a certain way. And, um, you know, I said he, you know, he should step down. He should resign. And people were going, Oh, come on. He's only got a couple months left. 
I don't care. You know, uh, see, it was March, and yeah, yeah, he was, his term was up. You know, mid May. Didn't I? Didn't care. I thought you know, even you know, even for that six weeks, he should resign. It's the right. principle. What he did right. was wrong. Otherwise, you're saying that you can do whatever you want as long as it's within a certain time period. Right. So uh, if he was breaking rules, if he was being promiscuous, whatever he was doing, they didn't like it. They should have expelled him. Now, here's, here's, you know, you came here, you knew the rules, you freely signed up, you sought to come, you're gone. But if they hadn't said anything or they hadn't done anything and hadn't removed him, then I don't think they have the right to withhold his diploma now. Uh, second of all, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, 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 I thought the, I thought the, uh, uh, the calendar was fun. I didn't see it being too, um, I guess you could say it, it contributes to sexualization of women. I don't know. I saw things more risque on the beach myself. I, you know, I have, I see more risque than that. Um, picking up my daughter um, at high school, not talking about my daughter's clothes, but I mean, that doesn't make it right um, when, you know, other things, but the reality was, is that the, um, the, the, the poses in that calendar, I mean, cause I, I, I'll tell you when I see any kind of uh, sort of sexualization of women, I mean, I, I immediately, no matter who it is, you know, I mean, a lot of guys look at that and go, ooh, ooh, you know, I'm sorry. I look at it as a dad and I go, that's somebody's daughter. How would I feel if I was that girl's dad, you know, and uh, okay. because uh, because I immediately think of my own daughters. All right. W with this thing, you know, would I want my daughters a part of it? Uh, you know, I might be a little uncomfortable with it just because I, I I'm I'm pretty, uh, you know, strict about what I let them wear and. And my is is somebody gonna look at the, at those pictures the wrong way? Hey, we're sinners, so yeah, probably. But then again, you know, just about any picture is gonna lead someone in the wrong direction. It, that wasn't the intent of this, though. And and I guess that's the way I, I look at this calendar. Is this calendar was a parody of the more of the the swimsuit calendars and all that kind of stuff. You know, it was women, you know, standing there with irons in their hands and, you know, and, and aprons and, and, and cooking, you know, muffins and cookies and, and, and stuff. And, and, uh, and, and they were, you know, it's like lift up a leg and, and stuff like that. This it's, I mean, it, it was the kind of poses and, and, and clothing that are, um, <clears throat> Okay, it was it was shorter than what you'd see on Leave It to Beaver, or, you know, Donna Reed or something like that, um, but it, it it wasn't it wasn't you know it wasn't really that risque. Uh, I suppose you know some people that want their that say that women should wear always wear nothing above the knee or whatever. Um, yeah, I guess they're gonna have a problem with it, and yeah, you know, we struggle with what is okay and what's not and, and stuff like that. But I know I, I look at this and say, this was, this was a joke. This was a parody of exactly the concern, um, that, that our writer has. And, uh, because I agree that we shouldn't objectify women. All right. I, I believe that it's okay to, um, to appreciate, um, God's work, but you know, there's a real fine line there between, um, well, God did a nice job when he made her and, uh, and boy, I wonder, um, what it would be like to be with her, you know, when you don't have any right to, to be thinking that, especially in this case, these are all married women, you know? Um, and, uh, so that's, you know, it generally you're better off. Like the Bible says, um, when it comes to sexual sin, flee from it, you know, don't walk that line. So, I mean, I would definitely say that if, if someone looks at this and is, is even remotely turned on by those pictures, boy, you should stay away from it. You know, I looked at it, I laughed and, you know, put it away and, and didn't look at it again. And, and I didn't, you know, it, it didn't have that effect on me, but, um, I, I mean, I, I appreciate and acknowledge his concern. You know, that we need to make sure 
to be respectful of women and also be respectful of anybody who is going to, that this is going to lead them um, into temptation, even if it's just a sort of mental, um, emotional temptation. Um, I mean, and and that's a reality. So there's Mm -hmm. always that danger. So concern noted. And um, I'm not sure I agree with you, but I understand where you're coming from. And, um, and and where you're coming from, I agree. So, but, you know, really appreciate the comment. And, um, and again, from anybody out there, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, like this person was, or any of the other um, file sharing sites, you can uh, leave a comment there. Uh, reminder that if you uh, want to watch more episodes, I mean, it's pretty late in the episode now, but um, you can go over to crossfeednews.com slash podcast, and um, you can either watch it there in a higher quality format, or you can subscribe to our podcast um, via iTunes or what have you, and, um, and get the higher quality version there too, because we have to compress it down quite a bit. Uh, for the file sharing sites. Oh, that is nasty. So, did I mention the email address? I don't know, but you can always write to us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Right. But this, folks, God bless you and have a very good weekend. Yeah. Good night, everybody. God bless you.